Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, a divorce for Sergeant Toaster. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Seth Nelson. And as always, I'm here with my good friend, Pete Wright. Divorce can be complicated. If you're a service member, you want to understand how you can manage those complications while navigating your military service and the service to our country. This week on the show, we are thrilled to introduce Paul Phipps, former U.S. Army military policeman with deployments taking him around the world. Pete, I'm excited about this one. Yeah, yeah. Because Paul is an attorney right here at Nelson Law Group. And we are proud to have him supporting and serving our clients and educating us and our listeners about the world of military divorce. Paul, welcome to the toaster. Thanks, Seth. You can just call me Jack Reacher if you'd like. I think it's appropriate. Yes, yes. lean in, lean in, Paul Phipps. Uh, I, I'm thrilled to have you on the show for the first time. Uh, we should give you a hearty welcome to the firm and the podcast. It's great to to have you here, Paul. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure, and it's great to be here. We uh, we're talking about military divorce. Um, and military divorce, it, we started to have this conversation some time ago and realized that that we were ill-equipped. We, we, we can talk about divorce all the live long day. But the <laughs> see, Pete, see, Pete, here's yeah. what you're already doing. Yeah. And Paul was very nice because he's only been on the show for like two minutes. He didn't say that's pretty much that. Everything that Seth talks about, he's <laughs> ill-equipped. <laughs> you know, I, what I love the most about you, uh, Seth, is that you are not afraid to walk into your own joke. That is that, that, that just yeah, or a glass <laughs> door, which I've done before. <laughs> the thing is, we've been ill-equipped, I- ill-equipped in talking about the uh, the nuances of uh, divorce in the military, because as a, a service member, there are different rules, right? So we hope that you can educate us in the nuance, in the specifics around uh, being an active service member. And getting a divorce and and dealing with we know that there are complications and emotional struggles and all of those things. But what else do you have to deal with when you're getting a divorce? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I guess I offer to you, where would you like to start? I was thinking we talk about like what what sort of legal assistance is available to you as a service member, but that might not be the best uh, the best place to start. What do you think? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that question uh, briefly based on what I know, but the, the government normally does not provide uh, divorce lawyers uh, via the military. We've, wrote, we've all seen JAG on TV and uh, the, the very salacious, uh, exciting military legal dramas. But unless things have changed, I don't believe that the military provides free lawyers or military enlisted lawyers to help service members with family law issues. And the reason behind that is likely that the people that are in the JAG Corps or the various military legal uh, departments, uh, they're, they're federal employees. And each state, even though it's a military divorce, every state does have its own spin and its own take on how to handle military divorces. I think the thing that hits me is what do you do knowing that you don't, you know, we don't have the salacious JAG support uh, for divorces? What do you do when you realize your relationship is taking a turn toward divorce and you're deployed? Oh, wait, you're 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 too far ahead, Pete. Am I? Yeah, you're too far ahead. You're thinking military deployment and people think of that as being overseas. Yeah, OK. Right? But this is why I'm excited about this All topic. Right. Rain, okay. rain me in because this is here it goes. It literally is check your local jurisdiction, because if you are stationed in McDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida, but you and your wife are technically still living and voting in Kansas. What's your jurisdiction? Where can you bring your suit? Are you a resident of Florida or are you resident of Kansas? And how does that all play in? That is a really important distinction. And this applies whether you're deployed or not deployed. If you are a military member, 
Uh, and again, I'm going to qualify this, but this is Florida law. Every state has its own nuance to this. But as far as jurisdiction, uh, we do have a residency, re- residency requirement exception in Florida in that a service member often where they're stationed is not where their driver's license is. It's not where their home base is. It's where they are for a temporary period of time. That's by design with military being stationed. I'm not talking about deployed. I'm just talking about a duty station. So in Florida, they can choose to file. If they are stationed at McDill or other, some other military base in Florida, they can choose to file in Florida. They can choose to fly, file where they have a permanent residence. And in the military, just being assigned somewhere does not make it your permanent residence. So that could be their hometown. Uh, they could also file where they own property. And they could also file where they last lived together as a married couple. And the suggestion, what I would give to anybody in the military contemplating divorce is to check the different jurisdictions, because based on your specific circumstance, one jurisdiction may suit your needs or benefit you more than the other. So the first thing would be figure out what your options are as far as jurisdiction, what states you can file. Then I would say get consultations with lawyers from each state And figure out the pros and cons uh, to having a divorce in that particular state. All right. Well, you have officially made my head hurt. And I think uh, everybody should not get married because that's too much work. Uh, See, you're trying to put us out of business. (laughs) And that's obviously an option. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, come on. He lays out a thorough answer. Yeah. He says, there's like four or five different states you can talk to. You're about to go through a divorce. You're protecting us. You're serving our country. Go talk to four or five different lawyers yeah. in different jurisdictions. That's a perfectly good it's answer. It's a perfectly good answer. It's <laughs> totally reasonable and realistic. Is it really realistic? I, I think it's realistic. I mean, I mean is, that what, is that what people do? You set up a whole bunch of different, in different states? You find a different divorce lawyer in a different state? That seems like while you're busy serving our country? Let let me qualify that. So there's a lot of options for the jurisdiction, right? But if you're just having a simple divorce and you really have no assets, you've only been married for a short period of time, you know, maybe you don't have any children, something simple like that. Maybe you don't want to put the time and effort into contacting different attorneys to find out which jurisdiction would benefit you the most. However, the more is at stake and divorce. Listen, guys, you all know, Divorce is super important, and at the end of the day, when the dust settles, that divorce decree or final judgment or whatever document comes out can have a huge life-changing impact on all involved. So the more that is at stake, I would suggest the more you would consider uh, checking all your options. This might be a can of worms that is also premature, so I stand ready to be uh, kicked down the field a little bit. But how does this how is this impacted when both parties are are active in the military? Is it easier or or more complicated? I think then they have to contact a lawyer in all 50 states. <laughs> <laughs> what about Guam? Do we do Guam? Uh, Guam. Too? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm only kidding. You know, if, <laughs> if the moon rose at 11.22 p.m., maybe Guam would be involved. But I, I, I it's the same level of complexity. So the moment that one service member is involved, uh, you know, the various uh, rules and regulations at a federal level are invoked. Uh, one of them is the USFSPA. And in a normal divorce, when I say normal, I don't mean that is better or worse. But if there are no military members involved, generally, when you are divorced, federal law prevents one one um, the former spouse from covering the other on insurance, right? So they generally lose their insurance benefits. The USFSPA is a federal rule, and Florida honors that, whereby under certain criteria, depending on the length of service, uh, how long the folks were married during the time of service, the s- divorcing non-military spouse may be eligible for continued health care um, uh, via the military. And that, that's one pretty big distinction that I think is important, because as we all know, health care can cost a fortune if you have to get it after you know, 15, 20 years and you got to do private pay. Okay. Do you, do you happen to know off the, off the dome what the conditions are? And, and I only ask not as a leading question, but I, I started reading about the 2020 20 rule. And does that play into what you're talking about? Yeah. The 2020 20 rule is exactly uh, what I'm referencing. 
uh, and I and I've just been a, a little bit aloof in avoiding giving any specifics because I've not checked the statute today. And as we all know, things change frequently, and I I am not up on federal law. But generally, a uh, twenty year marriage, twenty years of service during the marriage, uh, it, it qualifies the non military spouse for um, base benefits. Would be the PX or the BX, being able to continue to shop on base and enjoy those discounts. Uh, the health care that they I am literally counting how many acronyms that yeah. Paul's going to do because be you know I'm I'm already drunk he, he right was, now. Uh he was an MP, <laughs> right? He's at the BX. Yeah, we've got yeah. He mentioned er, he mentioned earlier today that he gets his TNA on HBO. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, Paul, I'm trying to practice law here. Yeah. Well, you, you, know, you know, the military is chock full of acronyms, so you better get used to it if you want to talk about this. <laughs> According to the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, approximately 10% of children live with a parent with an alcohol use disorder. This is an alarming statistic as a family law professional who deals with custody cases regularly. Finding the balance between the child's safety and helping the child maintain a relationship with both parents is one of the hardest things to navigate. Add in the he said, she said phenomenon that happens with divorcing couples who often weaponize alcohol use against one another, and the situation is even more difficult. All of this is why Soberlink has been one of the most important tools for my clients dealing with these issues. Soberlink's remote alcohol monitoring tool has helped over 500,000 people prove their sobriety and provide peace of mind regarding the child's safety. Soberlink helps keep the focus on the best interest of the child, which is really the most important part in a divorce case dealing with children. I've teamed up with Soberlink to create a parenting plan guide to help people going through divorce that involves alcohol in children. And you can download it today at Soberlink.com slash toaster. And if you take a look and you think you're ready to order Soberlink, just mention how to split a toaster for $50 off their device price. Our thanks to Soberlink for sponsoring How to Split a Toaster. Okay, well, so I do want to get back to our to our question about deployment because I this is a, a jurisdictional question. What if the jurisdiction where you are in is not in the United States? The jurisdiction, if you're living in Germany, for instance, and let me just qualify. I think Seth clarified this before, and I promise not to use any acronyms. There's a difference between being deployed and being stationed somewhere. Yes. So, and there's also a difference between being an active duty service member and a non-active duty service member. So let me just break those down very quickly. The active duty service member is someone who is a full-time employee of that armed service. Uh, those are the people that generally qualify. Here's the acronym, I lied, SCRA, right? So the Service Member Civil Relief Act is a huge federal law. Um, Florida has incorporated its own version of it, but to be an active duty service member, you can invoke those uh, those rights. As far as reservists and National Guard, if they are made active duty, because it points in their career, if they're um, drilling or doing something like that, I, in some instances, they are active duty, so the SCRA, SCRA would apply. When you talk about deployment, Deployment is when someone is deployed for some type of conflict. So, for instance, uh, without giving names, I've had many cases where people are deployed from MacDill and they go overseas and they get orders that they have to go to a certain theater and they have to be engaged in combat operations or combat support. In that instance, in not only divorce actions, but in post-judgment, which means custody after the fact, the service member is guaranteed a 90-day stay on all proceedings. And the, the theory behind that, and that's a federal law, and Florida has, has, is right on with it. So Florida's in, uh, incorporated that. The theory behind that is we've got men and women who are defending this country, trying to keep us safe, and it really would not be fair. Uh, or, I, I mean, if people learned that they could get essentially screwed by protecting the country, and when they came back, they lost everything or a whole bunch of legal decisions were made without them, I think we'd probably lose a lot of service members because it's not very palatable. So that protects them for 90 days. After that 90 days, you can file a motion and request additional uh, time for a stay. That's why I kind of slows you down, Pete, because where you're living or stationed 
as opposed to being deployed are much different, right? Because you can basically say, look, I'm deployed. I'm defending our country. I'm in a theater of war. We're going to just put this divorce on hold for 90 days, right? And guess what? Come 90 days, my orders are to stay. We're going to ask for another 90 days. I've got some friends who work for the Department of Defense, and uh, the one spouse is a speech language pathologist. They are stationed in Germany, and her husband uh, is not working. If they get a divorce, like they've been living in Germany together as a family working for the Department of Defense for five or six years now, that is, is is that covered under the same set of statutes that we're, we've been talking about, or is that a completely separate issue? It's my understanding and belief that a DOD employee is, is very different than a, a military service member. So I, I think they would just be an average civilian that would be living outside the continental U.S. Okay, got it. It's really important when you have a deployment versus a station. And also, McDill Air Force Base is uh, actually, they have CENTCOM there, which is Central Command, and they run the part of the world called the Middle East. So these guys are busy down there, okay? So you have a guy stationed at McDill, Paul, and he's deployed, already divorced. And his aunt, uncle, grandparents, his parents, they all live in Tampa. And now the kid goes to mom. Parents, ex-husband, ex-wife don't get along. Ex-husband is in the military. He's deployed. He's defending our country. And mom says, no, I'm not going to let him see the grandparents. I'm not going to let the grandkids see the grandparents because you're deployed. I never felt I got enough time with our kid anyway because we had to split it 50-50 when we got divorced. I'm keeping him 100% of the time, not seeing the grandparents, not seeing the relatives. That doesn't seem fair, right, Pete? No, it seems it seems uh, terrible. So the, the, the acronym that I gave you before, the SCRA, Florida's version of that, it was recently changed, and I, I should have brushed up on this. I think it was 2020 or 2021, very recent change. Uh, it used to be that the service member prior to the change could simply assign somebody to be in their stead for their time sharing, right? So that the theory and the reasoning behind that is uh, who better to keep the close connection between child or children and service member when they're deployed than someone who's close to the service member, right? So the, the, the new statute in Florida requires a little more work on the service member's part. And, and I'm, I'm going to say, if you're in the midst of a military divorce, uh, I would highly suggest that you talk to your lawyer or whoever's helping you and, and try to incorporate something in the agreement as far as assigning your time sharing uh, slash custody rights in the event that you're deployed. Because the way the statute sits now, you're going to have to file a motion. You have to file an affidavit and support. There's a whole bunch of hoops to jump through. And if you have that locked down already at the end of the dissolution of marriage, it, it makes things go much, much more smoothly. And the other thing on that, Pete, just just to clarify, I, I, and, you know, usually you're ganging up on me, Pete, with the other guest that isn't lawyer. We got two lawyers for a yeah, few no, today, which I kind of like. It. No, yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> um, is that if you put something in your agreement, your marital settlement agreement dealing with finances or your parenting plan dealing with the kids, that can lock it down and you don't have to worry about the change in the law. Be, uh, like, w so is this this is one of those things where your agreement changes Florida law that you were telling me about? Yeah, in previous cases. So what happens is in like for Paul's example is it, you could say if I get deployed, then I um, any time that I would have been home is allowed to go to um, grandpa, my new my grandpa or my new spouse or if I'm re if I'm remarried. Or, so, you know, you can do all these different if thens. If I'm remarried, it can be with my new spouse because, you know, she's going to make sure that grandpa gets it or it can go with grandpa or it can go with my aunts or a blood relative. You can define this any way you want. Right. And then if whatever these acronym laws that Paul's talking about change down the road, it doesn't matter because in your agreement, you've locked it down. And one thing to add to that, Seth, the, the SCRA 
that that's a right for the service member. So the SCRA doesn't protect the non-military spouse. So what Seth's saying is right. I mean, if everybody agrees to something, the, these acts and all these acronyms are designed to protect the service member and therefore the ser- service member to invoke. So it's never going to run afoul with that because these uh, the SCRA is pro-service member. Okay. See, little it's a little different than what we're normally talking about, right? One, you're a federal employee. Two, you might be stationed in a different place. Three, you might be deployed in a theater of war. And that's a whole just other, you know, layers of this onion. And one other quick side note, I know we're, we're, we do divorce at this firm and we specialize in family law matters. But, but if anyone is listening to this, the SCRA has a, a wide net. I, I mean, if you're fishing, this is a giant net. So, you know, loans, financial obligations, residences, evictions. So I would encourage anybody that's in the military that's facing any type of legal issue to contact either JAG or a local attorney and find out what SCRA, SCRA protections they may have available to them. I, I feel like I, I'm going to represent the non-military party here. Like everything that we're talking about in favor of protecting and in favor of support of the service member, what does that do for the non-military service member? It starts to feel a little bit like the balance of uh, of support is a little bit out of whack. Like if you're you're just risk being kind of left in the wind, say say you are. Uh, living abroad, say you are, you know, what what is there to help protect you in the case of a divorce and you're not a member of the military and you, you're you a young family and maybe you haven't been married for 20 years and fall outside of the USFSPA 202020 rule? That just rolled right off your tongue, brother. I love it. I did pretty good, right? Pretty good. <laughs> wildly impressive. Pretty that was wildly good. impressive. Yeah. Okay. My question <laughs> stands. I, I, I appreciate the question in in you really have dived into an area of inquiry that is the problem with divorce that we spoke about with with Michael Lundy is you're in an adversarial system right so then you try to even the playing field and all these rules that protect the service members they feel like well wow they benefit them they benefit them they benefit them but what i think they actually do is protect the process, right? The the non-military spouse, and Paul will always correct me if I'm wrong, he does it daily, right? Is, so when they say, well, I really want to get divorced quickly and my guy's been deployed for a year and this has been delaying that deployment, well, okay, I get it. But in the meantime, you've had the children the entire year. Right. Right. You're not fighting over the kids or all the other craziness that Paul and I see on an everyday where, oh, he was supposed to drop him off and he didn't. Or, you know, you've been living in the house. It's been getting paid. And here's the kicker, Pete. And this is the, what I'm going to call is the equalizer. Paul, what happens when a spouse of a military member calls up their military member's superior officer and says, he moved out three weeks ago, and he's not paying the rent or any child support. Yes. So the military has its own uh, body of laws called the UCMJ, the U- Uniform Code of Military Justice. I know that because I'm Jack Reacher, and those are the <laughs> rules that I enforce and, and move around by. But uh, they they are very, very in tune with supporting family members. And if uh, a non-military spouse calls the command of a military spouse, and reports any type of way beyond uh, any type of unethical behavior or putting that non-military spouse in a, in a bad situation uh, to try to punish them or wield financial authority over them, the military itself will correct that. And uh, being a former member of the military, you know, you, you say we're you say I was a federal employee, but you literally lose all your rights as a military member. There, there's a high level of irony. That as a military member, you're defending the country and you're defending freedom, but you literally lose all your rights. On any given day, someone could just pick me up by the scruff of my neck and say, you're going to Iraq, you're going to Beirut, you're going here, and I have no say in it. They're going to inject me with 15 different vaccines. I have no say in it. So uh, the military members literally 
are under a much, I, I think they'd much rather be sued by a lawyer than have their command come down on them and, and start invoking the UCMJ and, uh, you know, Article 15 and all that. It's so threatening to me, Seth, when someone uh, like Paul says the military will correct that. That is a threatening statement delivered threateningly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and but it's not just a threat. Oh, no, <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Right. Us, no. Us civilian guys were like, wow, that's a big threat for the military guys. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. It's All not right. even a threat. Like when I went by Paul's office today and he was sitting down because if he's standing up, I cannot reach the top <laughs> of his shirt. OK, but when he was sitting down, I grabbed him by the back and I said, dude, get me lunch. That didn't work. That didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I even was like, put it on the firm credit card. Didn't, didn't work. work. You no. Know. Well, let me give you a very, very succinct example yes. of that. So th this is going to sound so foreign to people who have never been in the military. But if you do something in the military, wrong in the military, they can literally dock your pay and just take pay away from you. That's it. It's a rule. They're allowed to do it. There's no dispute process. That's it. If you did it wrong, it's called Article 15. One of their options is to, to dock your pay a certain amount. And that's something that we just don't see here in the United States. Otherwise, Seth wouldn't be paying me anything. He'd be docking my pay weekly for all the things I mess up. But... <laughs> for all the lunches you don't get. <laughs> well, it's not that he didn't get it. I appreciate that. But when he gets the lunch order wrong. <laughs> I mean, come on, Pete. Come on, Paul. The line must be drawn here. <laughs> but the other thing, you know, you're talking about the uh, the, the non-military spouse and feeling that it's lopsided. You, you talked about the 2020-20, right? I, I mean, you know, a military spouse is protected by the military and by DFAS. There's another acronym for you, Seth. Um, the Department of Defense uh, Accounting and Spending, I think that's, and they require that that, the spouse can continue to get health insurance. They can continue to receive those benefits. And I'm here to tell you guys, the military is not a super high paying job. People that stay in usually do it because there are really exceptional benefits. So the government has really, you know, put their money where their mouth is. And they're saying, hey, if you're a spouse and you're committed to this and you're a military spouse for all these years, we're going to treat you right. We're going to give you stuff that you can't get, cannot get as a, a civilian. That's fascinating. Well argued. Well argued. Well done. Yes. Um, OK, so any other complicating issues around separating um, uh, property and uh, the stuff, the stuff that, that accumulates in the marriage, anything that's unique or different in a military divorce? I'm going to I'm going to jump in here, if I may, Paul, because we're going to represent two sides of this. Military member. Married over 10 years maybe much longer and they've been getting their pension and they just want to hold on to that. And I represent the non-military spouse and I get to tell my non-military spouse, you are entitled to half that pension. What does the military member think about that, Paul? Uh, the military members are usually not super happy about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, they've, they've put the time in and they've risked their lives arguably, or have been willing to risk their lives. So I, I think, it really depends on the person, but that, that's not really a benefit of, of being a service member. It definitely benefits the non-military spouse. And, uh, you know, some people want to say, I, I think my wife or my husband deserves it, depending on who's the military service member. But but some don't. And the, the reasoning behind it, guys, is if someone is in the military and they have either a wife or a husband that has been a non-military spouse for 20 years, they have essentially allowed that person and just like al just like alimony somewhat they've they've allowed them to progress through their career to maintain the household because even if you're not deployed to a combat zone military personnel are routinely and frequently shuffled around for what here's an acronym TDY temporary duty go here for 3 weeks go there for 4 weeks so if you have a spouse they're putting in the time and quite frankly it's next to impossible for a military spouse to have a career because very few people in the military stay at the same location for a long period of time. And I define long period as more than four years. Their job is moving, in some cases, moving the family, yeah. moving everything. Yeah. yeah. And we all know how much fun that is. That's a delight. It's, I, I, oh, are you being sarcastic okay uh the, i you know i i feel like i've i've learned a lot what do you uh, what do you think uh as the as the 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 vessel of ignorance what am i missing in my understanding given our conversation today 
uh, uh, that people should know going into a divorce situation in the military? I think every divorce is unique, every family is unique, and every situation is unique. But I, I think the overarching thing all service members should know is that there are resources available to you, especially if you're being deployed. Uh, the system is not set up in a way where one person can just be hoodwinked, for lack of a better term, when they're gone. And someone can say, oh, we tried to serve them service by publication, which is a method of serving someone by saying we can't locate them. If you're in the military, that can't happen. They're not allowed to do that. So if you're in the military, I, if you're going to get divorced, you've got to seek consult. Start with your JAG office or your local military office. Um, I, I'm on one of the Hillsborough County uh, military affairs committees, and I know the people at JAG actually have a list of local lawyers that to give to the service members. So information is power. And, you know, your job as a service member is to serve the country and do what your specialty is. And, you know, reach out to JAG, find out who you can talk to, find out about the SCRE, find out about how this is going to impact your pension, find out about child custody and the future ramifications of entering into a marital settlement agreement, because you use the word ignorance. But if a service member is not aware of that, and they have attorneys not aware of that, they may enter into something that's going to not be so good for them down the road. And the other thing on that same thing, Pete, when you talk about like what should the service member know is I have never had a judge do anything but bend over backwards to make those um, processes in the judicial system fair. And with Zoom, which we've all been doing now, before that, we frequently would do uh, phone hearings and have different ways to confirm that the military member who's in South Korea is the person that they say they are. Like there's all these steps. Now with Zoom, it's gotten a lot easy. Show up your military ID. They can look at it right there on Zoom, but they will bend over backwards to make sure that you get your day in court appropriately. And that is good for everybody. That's good for the non-military spouse. That's good for the military spouse. That's good for a judicial system. And sometimes it's just good because they're settling their case. And I've, you know, and and I've had judges that are very classy say to them, thank you for your service, which you've all heard before, and then look to the non-military spouse and say the same thing. That is classy. Yeah. Uh, I uh, learned a ton today. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Paul. It sounds like uh, lesson number one is make sure you're asking your attorney, do you understand the, uh, wait a minute, the USFSPS and the SCRA? Do you understand those two things? And if they don't, call more lawyers. There are a lot of lawyers and you'll have to call them in every state. So better get started. Yeah, and every, everything in the military goes through the chain of command. So, I mean, everybody has a boss in the military. Ask your boss. If they don't know, they'll ask their boss. I mean, it, it'll get all the way up there because the military does like to take care of their own and they want to give them the resources to Seth's point to make the process fair. They're not looking for a leg up, but things need to be fair and service members are in a unique employment and a unique situation. So appreciate uh, your wisdom today, Paul. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. It's my pleasure. And Pete. Yeah. I got to thank you because I thought for sure you're going to say, all right, Paul, you're on the inside, man. What is Seth messing up on a daily basis? And you just let that slide the whole show. I feel like I don't even need to ask. So next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody, for downloading. Did you know? Wait, 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 oh, wait, wait, wait. Did you see what Paul said? It's the next <laughs> podcast. He's like, like, wait, he's who, already we ready. We need a whole we need a whole show on this. <laughs> after after you grab me by the scruff of my shirt and tried to get me to get like demanded yeah. lunch, I, I'm going to spill all the There beans, will man. be podcasts. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We sure appreciate you. Remember to uh, get, drop us some questions. We've got a link on the website. You can uh, uh, fill in your form. We would love to take your divorce questions. Please send us your divorce questions, and we will we'll th I'll, I'll throw them right at Seth. I will throw them at Seth, and maybe I'll even throw them at Paul. We're going to do a round robin. Q&A. If you send us the questions, I, we will answer them. I like yeah. it. And we'll answer non-divorce questions, too. Sure. We might not get them right, but sure. we'll answer them. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of Paul Phipps and Seth Nelson, oh dear, America's other favorite divorce attorney, 
Er, I'm Pete Wright. <laughs> we'll catch you next week right back here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida. <laughs>